Hi, everyone. Welcome to the LGBT Bars podcast and webinar series, where we cover issues around promoting justice through the legal profession for the LGBTQ community in all of its diversity. My name is Judy O'Kelly, and I'm the Chief Program Officer for the National LGBT Bar Association and Foundation. If you'd like to continue to hear content like this, please be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts to be notified when we release a new episode. And if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button there. Today we're talking about voting rights in America, and we're speaking particularly for our audience of LGBTQ law students. I'm delighted to have two outstanding lawyers with extensive experience in this area as guests today. I'd like to first introduce Nancy Abudu. Nancy is the Deputy Legal Director for the Southern Poverty Law Center's Voting Rights Practice Group. In that role, she leads a team of lawyers, community organizers, and technical experts in protecting and strengthening the voting rights of minority communities and other politically vulnerable populations. Prior to joining SPLC, Nancy was the legal director for the ACLU of Florida and a senior staff attorney with the ACLU's Voting Rights Project. Welcome, Nancy. Good to have you. Thank you. Also joining us, yeah, glad you're here. Also joining us today is Laura Brill. Laura is the founder and director of the Civic Center, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to improving high school voter registration rates. Laura is a founding partner at the litigation boutique Kendall Brill and Kelly LLP in Los Angeles and served as a law clerk to U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She is a certified appellate specialist and has been a law school guest lecturer at Georgetown, Stanford, UC Irvine, UCLA, USC, and Yale, and publishes and speaks widely on legal issues, including the First Amendment, copyright, appellate practice, and the legal profession. Thanks so much for being here, Laura. Nice to be here, Judy. So voting is pretty much the most clear right and responsibility that we as Americans are supposed to have. It's core to what we all think of when we think about our democratic republic, to that whole idea of one person, one vote, representing our personal input to all these systems that govern our everyday life. And yet the actual premise of one person, one vote is still not being actualized, both because of barriers and sometimes because people just don't exercise that right. We're recording this today, October 22nd, with about a week and a half to go before the 2020 presidential election. And voting, voting is pretty much what the country is talking about, and particularly issues about voting in a time of a pandemic, and in a time when it seems that attacks on our voting rights and fears about suppression are heightened. So we're going to be addressing the issues of the day, but we also want to make clear for everyone that this is an evergreen topic. We're not going to be resolving all the challenges that America is facing here over the next few years. So we really want to help law students in particular understand the range of challenges that we're facing in our country and how all of you can help in, in both now and in your future careers. So I want to kick us off today with some basic questions. You know, who's voting in our country? Who doesn't and why? And I'm, I'd kind of like to run this through thinking about kind of the, the, the life cycle of, of a voter and, you know, what they experience in our system. Um, so I thought we could start by talking about, you know, what is keeping people from even being able to register to vote? Um, Nancy, do you want to want to kick us off? Sure. Well, I mean, there are some requirements that can serve as obstacles. One is a voter registration deadline, which not everyone is able to comply with, which is one of the reasons why in terms of solutions, Folks have recommended same-day voter registration or automatic voter registration. I think another issue, which is one of the biggest issues facing a number of states, especially those in the South, is the issue of felon disenfranchisement and the denial of voting rights to someone solely because they have a felony conviction and then re-enfranchisement laws that make it almost impossible for someone to get their rights restored because they can't comply. And the issues of compliance tend to surround financial obligations and the inability of people to be able to meet them so that they can be eligible to register and vote. So those are some of the issues that SPLC is working on to address to focus again on solutions. Okay. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so the Civic Center, we focus on young uh, people and first time voters and with an eye toward really improving voter registration in high school and civic engagement in high school. And there's a few reasons for that. Some of it is relates to, you know, I think what your question is, Judy, about like, what are the barriers and a lot of the barriers for young people 
Um, there are some systemic barriers like what uh, Nancy is talking about that I can talk about in a second, but the biggest barrier is lack of civics education and just not being asked to register to vote and not being presented you know with the opportunity you know one, one of the ways i think about it is that in any sort of you know marketing um campaign people throw out the number of seven touches that you need seven touches to kind of run a contact into a uh, you know a um, undertaking a transaction and for most young people were not even asking them to register to vote at all much less you know seven times which is what you know should be happening um so that's and and what we see is for young people is that the biggest barrier to turnout really is registration and overcoming that as an obstacle and young people have some you know as a demographic have some obstacles in terms of being highly mobile um you know some people being in college and and so that's just kind of um you know inherit in being in in that youth um age group um but um but there are some there are some legal structures that really make things can make things challenging like um online online voter registration is great right and it's supposed to make things simple but most states that have it you need a to use the online system and so a lot of young people don't have a state id because they they're not bothering to get driver's licenses or they have any need for um you know an official state id and their school um their school id might not be acceptable for an online system so that's a big um obstacle um and then even in some states like in, i'm in california and you know we have online i mean i'm sorry we do have online voter registration but we all which has this um this problem with the id uh, requirement we also have automatic voter registration at the dmv um, but it's not working for young people and what i mean by that is um, most young people who are getting their driver's licenses they get their learner's permit at age 15 and a half not 16. And so even though we have pre-registration allowing young people to pre-register at age 16, the two systems don't talk well to one another. So the DMV people miss the uh, the pre-registration um, you know opportunity. And as a result, even in a you know state that is trying to have pro-voting laws, only about 12 percent of young people are pre-registered in the state of in the state of california and we have among the worst voter registration rates of any state um you know any state in the country so um you know we'll, we can come back later to talk about different opportunities but but uh that's some of the problems that that young people face in getting and um you know getting their voices heard and i will say that it's been you know exponentially harder with the pandemic and the cancellation of, you know, voter registration drives and high schools in the spring and, you know, all the summer concerts and other, um, you know, events where people would have come together to register. Even, even leafleting on the street and, and uh, yeah, all the kind of things we tend to see on our corners are not happening right now, yeah. Thank you. Um, Nancy, can I go back to the, um, the issue you raised about, you know, having disenfranchisement and um, I wonder if we could just specifically give the example of Florida, um, which voted, um, I believe, four years ago to restore felon rights in that state, um, and uh, and yet we've seen those efforts curtailed by the courts. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And first, Florida has always been one of three or four, depending on executive order, states that have permanently denied people the right to vote, meaning that in order to get your rights restored, you actually had to go through an executive process or a place like Mississippi, for example, where you actually have to get an individual suffrage bill in your name. So that's why we focus on the South when we talk about the continuing effects of felon disenfranchisement laws. So after several really decades of unsuccessfully petitioning the state legislature to amend its restoration process, the Florida voters bypassed the legislature and initiated their own ballot initiative that got almost 65% of Floridians to vote in favor of a law that would automatically restore voting rights upon completion of sentence. And that's defined in the statute of the ballot initiative, prison, parole, and probation. 
What we had then a couple of months later was the Florida legislature passing its own law, Senate Bill 7066, that then what we believe redefined completion of sentence to include payment of legal financial obligations. And one of the many problems with this law is that there's so many people who exit the criminal system owing money, fines and fees that are automatically imposed regardless of the offense committed, and then victim restitution, even oftentimes when people don't know how much they really need to pay and to whom they should make those payments. So we, along with several other coalition partners, sued the state of Florida, arguing that this law was essentially a poll tax. It was requiring people to pay money in order to vote. We also try to emphasize the level of wealth discrimination in terms of the law being a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. And then we focus just on due process in general. The state is, still does not have a centralized database to be able to provide information authoritatively as to who owes money and how much they owe and again to whom they should make that payment. Um, we got a wonderful ruling in the local court, in the district court, as to those three claims. I'll mention that the SPLC filed our own lawsuit in which we also raised gender-based claims. We argue that if you look even more specifically within the category of low-income women of color, you see that the wage gap disparities that continue to exist before during and after exposure to the criminal justice system prove that these women most likely will never be able to pay off these obligations and therefore wouldn't be able to vote. So we won on a, some of the bigger claims on the gender-based claims, we not so successful. And actually we raised a 19th amendment claim for gender, um, a very infrequently used constitutional amendment. And so, you know, one in the lower court had a pretty um, painful loss in the 11th Circuit en banc ruling. We got a great dissent emphasizing, you know, the rationale behind the district court's decision. But essentially, the 11th Circuit decided that once you are branded a felon in our society, you essentially enjoy very little, if any, constitutional protections when it comes to accessing the ballot box. And even a law as straightforward as Florida's, which on its face, we believe is a poll tax, still was able to withstand constitutional muster. So where we are right now is our gender-based claims were stayed pending the main appeal. And the filing that I got done last night with my team was related to our cross appeal on the gender claims. So we're hopeful that the court will at least seriously consider the fact that, again, based on the, the data, there is a population that will probably never be able to satisfy their obligations. And that really, you know, both the Equal Protection Clause and the 19th Amendment were intended to elevate or heighten protections for women, especially women of color who are at the intersection of so many areas of discrimination. So we are continuing with the fight, but it was very painful, difficult to have to tell my clients, older African American women who've lived in Florida for decades that they cannot vote for the President of the United States on November 3rd. Thank you for that work. So I think we've, we've covered a lot of the barriers that cause people to not even be able to register. Um, you know, I think there's some other things that we're seeing in flux even right now. Registration deadlines are being questioned. I think Arizona is one that's still being litigated. One of maybe North Carolina as well, is that right? Um, I think there's several states where we're we're still questioning what the the actual registration deadline is, and that may be being litigated for a while. Um, but then, you know, once once people are registered, for the people who are able to do that, what are the challenges that you see them people facing just getting to exercise that right? Um, and I I think we can break this both into you know first voting by mail or by Dropbox um, in for people who have applied to vote absentee or in states. Um, like my home state of Washington, where you vote by mail um, as a as a matter of course, and then and then second, we'll talk about voting in person, both advance and on the day. 
Um, so with respect to voting by mail, um, what, are, what are some barriers we see there in, with regard to the application process and then even just getting it in on time? Yeah. Oh, I'll kick it off. I, you know, I think some of the, this year, just the complexity and the moving targets, I think, are creating, um, you know, big barriers because, you know, the more people have questions and, and doubt that things will work out, the less likely they are to try. Um, in, in, on the mail-in ballots, I mean, there's just so much variety and, and Nancy may have her, you know, finger on more of the pulse than, you know, than I do. We have some states where also Cal California has mailed ballots to everybody and, you know, there's, so those are great. Um, uh, in Pennsylvania, there's a rule, I mean, just some of the complexities of these rules of like, does your signature match or what happens to your ballot if you forget to put a signature on it, and will you have an opportunity to cure if there, if somebody is questioning whether your ballot is really yours? So those are some, um, uh, you know, complexities. So I was going to say in Pennsylvania, there's a rule that you know there's like a um, an envelope a, uh, that you have to insert your ballot into, like a privacy envelope before you insert it into the um, envelope that actually has the address of the registrar and there's been a ruling that if you fa if the voter fails to use that extra security envelope that their vote will not count so you know I think both the compl complexity and just because of the complexity is very hard to provide education to voters about it in this very compressed time because you know you have national groups that um, may not have the you know personal connections with local people and trying to do national education, <laughs> and then you have you know local groups strapped for um, you know strapped for funds. But um, you know I think that's those are some of the complexities I see. Not then that I haven't even talked about you know voter intimidation at the polls <laughs> and um, uh, in California we had some people, we have drop boxes, official drop boxes up in many places. And then um, there was a group of, um, uh, a group in LA County that put up fake um, drop boxes that looked official. And I think they've changed some of the language to make them look a little less official, but, you know, doing um, uh, kind of intentionally creating trickery and confusion is, you know, not helping things. And, and the courts ruled that as expressly not okay, correct? Yeah. And yet, and yet, that group is continuing to keep the boxes down. Nancy. Yeah, I mean, I think when for me, when I think of the vote by mail situation, of course, we have to look at it right now in the context of COVID. So I look at it pre COVID and post, and a lot of the post COVID situ um, circumstances have are only exacerbated because the issues we identified on the front end were never fully resolved. And some of those have to do with number one, the failure for a lot of states to provide a cure opportunity. In Florida, for example, we found that there were a significant number of absentee ballots that were rejected because the signature alleg allegedly didn't match. And then there was a racial disparity as well as an age disparity where we found that African Americans, of course, were one of the highest purged or rejected in terms of the rate. And then senior citizens who understandably their signatures have changed over the years. And then young people, especially for the group that Laura services who may not have taken their first ever signature that seriously. And so there's a lack of consistency for future documents. Um, so the uh, lack of a cure opportunity, the counting of ballots, we've seen that that has been a big issue. We've always had problems with the mail and people receiving and then being able to have their ballots received on time in order for them to count. But now we see that's even a bigger issue because of all of the publicized problems with the Postal Service and some would say intentional undermining of the system as well as the fact that government officials, mail workers are legitimately overwhelmed by the volume of work that they have to do given that the mail in and of itself has been a primary means of people remaining in communication. So even though some would say that the mail issues were a, an effort to target vote by mail 
ballots, the consequences that people are also having problems getting their medicine on time, getting other important documents delivered to them on time. So it was almost, you know, there's a collateral consequence related to this effort to make it more difficult for people to vote by mail. And then I think another issue that we've had to deal with is where you can drop your your, your ballot. Uh, you know, Laura was talking about drop boxes. We pushed for more drop boxes and curbside voting to help alleviate some of the pressure on the mail. And unfortunately, we faced resistance from the courts on that as well. Just last night, we got an order from the Supreme Court staying a very good decision we got out of a district court in Alabama which instituted what Justice Sotomayor said in her dissent, a pretty modest injunction, just saying that if counties want to create a curbside voting, they should be able to do that without resistance from the Secretary of State, and the Supreme Court just stayed that. So now an opportunity that voters had to exercise their right to vote has been blocked. And, and with no real solution within the next week and a half. So again, I think that the problems that we're seeing now are just emblematic of, of election administration, administrators failing to address the problem on the front end. Right, and, and can I just add, I, you know, I think Nancy, you put this in the context of things are being exacerbated that had been, you know, have always been problems. And, you know, I think we haven't yet mentioned Shelby County, but since this is a group of law students, I just wanted to, you know, kind of, can I give the quick overview of, of Shelby County, which is, um, so the Voting Rights Act, you know, of 1965 is our nation's signature uh, voting rights law. And it had two main provisions, right? There's section two says, you can't have, states can't have laws that result in discrimination based on race. And section five was a sort of a prophylactic measure that said with certain uh, states and, and smaller, you know, local jurisdictions that had a bad history of racial discrimination, um, those states and, and localities had to pre-clear uh, their changes in voting laws with the Department of Justice. And it was a very effective system and made for smooth election processing because election litigation is um, really challenging because everything is being done with very tight timelines with an eye toward an election. And once somebody is elected, then they're the incumbent. <laughs> and um, even if they're elected under a discriminatory law, and it's very hard to undo, um, and courts are reluctant to undo the results of, um, you know, of elections. So, um, so section five was a very effective law. Congress repeatedly reauthorized it. And the last reauthorization was in 2006, which had a huge amount of evidence of ongoing discrimination uh, based on race and um, ethnicity. Uh, what Congress did not do in 2006 was um, the, the covered jurisdictions, they're called covered jurisdictions, were created by a formula uh, and Congress didn't update the formula in 2006. They relied on the original formula. And so despite all the evidence of ongoing you know, discrimination, the Supreme Court looked at that in the Shelby County case and and invalidated Section 5 um, of the Voting Rights Act, which was, has, you know, immediately created an opportunity for, um, you know, jurisdictions with a long history of discrimination of just going right back to, you know, um, the same practices. So, so it's, um, uh, you know, Justice Ginsburg wrote a famous dissent in that and talked about, uh, you know, made the analogy that throwing out the voting rights, you know, section, um, this was section four where the formula was throwing out, but throwing out this portion of the Voting Rights Act because it was working was like, you know, throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Um, and, that, and that's what we're seeing right now is we're really seeing the exacerbation of um, I think, you know, of, of Shelby County and things being just thrown into, um, you know, a lot of turmoil as a result. Thank you. And I mean, I can think of several other examples we haven't even mentioned. I know just yesterday, the Iowa Supreme Court upheld a law that 
you know, as we were talking about the curing problem, this is about curing um, uh, flaws in absentee ballot applications on behalf of voters when when the um, when the Division of Elections had the information, um, but it wasn't on the form. Um, so now county auditors have to send the applications back to the applicants to correct, you know, and with the time frame that we're on now, that's effectively going to mean thousands of people aren't going to get the ballot in time to vote them. Um, and we also, of course, have seen Texas um, just dramatically reduce the number of, of available drop boxes um, in at least three counties, in, including the counties uh, around uh, both Austin and Houston. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think all those are the kind of procedures you're talking about that should be should be forced to go through some form of review and yet, you know, are just sort of done more on a whim now and in the, the wake of, of getting rid of that and Shelby, thank you for that. Um, so, so turning to the, you know, similar kind of challenges about voting in person, both in advance and on the day. I mean, we've all seen these, these horror stories on our Facebook feeds and in the news of people who've been standing in line for 10 hours. I mean, I have friends who've stood in line in Georgia to vote for, for 10 hours, anywhere from six to 10 pretty regularly. It's looking like it's starting to drop um, somewhat as the, as the days are going by, but it's still very, very long waits in, in places and mostly as it seems in places that are where predominantly black voters live. Um, do you all wanna talk about, about that and other challenges we see to voting in person? Sure. I mean, you know, I think the vote by mail discussion, though, informs in part why we're seeing a lot of these long lines. So many people in Georgia for our primary did not receive their absentee ballot. I have to give them so much credit for standing in the line for that long, but that's absolutely ridiculous, unreasonable, and should not be the case at all. Um, so in addition to administration problems, at the, at the county offices, we also had problems in, turn of, in terms of poll worker trainings. I mean, can you imagine standing in line for hours and then you get up there and they tell you, well, we already sent you an absentee ballot so you can't vote, or this is not your polling place so you can't vote, or whatever it is, after all those hours, I mean, the likelihood that you're not gonna lose it or <laughs> just go home and call it a day, you know, I mean, that's just the reality. So. One of the things that we've been doing is encouraging people to make sure they get their ballots, their absentee ballots, because that's the fastest and still, we believe, safest way. Um, but we've also been encouraging people to get, that, get out there and vote early. The early voting lines have been long too, but it just, you know, you don't want to wait until election day to, to try to exercise this right, especially because you don't know what kind of administrative problems you're going to have and you want to have enough time to resolve those. So we're, we're expecting to see, still see long lines, but we're hoping that at least we will have seen some improvements and they won't be as long. Yeah, and I agree with what Nancy says. And I, I want to say, just emphasize the bright spot of the early voting, because I think so many with COVID, um, you know, more states ha are allowing early voting. And I think it's going to be incredibly popular and, you know, hard to get rid of because it's obviously so sensible. Like, why should we be all having to vote on a Tuesday? It doesn't make, you know, one single day. It doesn't make you know, it doesn't make any sense. And so, and, you know, in terms of just enthusiasm and people wanting to vote, I think 40 million votes have already been cast. And in LA County alone, I heard that a million votes have already been cast. And, um, you know, that's, you know, that could be a big, once people get used to something, I think it's harder to go back. And that could be a really long lasting, helpful change. And also gives you a chance to fix things, right? For first time voters, um, if they're, I mean, I agree 100% with you, Nancy, like to be told after waiting online, you know, go back and whatever, get your ID or you didn't, you know, you did something wrong. But I'd rather them be told that on, you know, two weeks out and have the chance to do it again than, um, you know, have election day, you know, a single day be the only opportunity. But mostly, like mostly things are going, right, pretty smoothly. I think we write it, we, it doesn't feel like all this early voting is in chaos. We're not hearing a lot of stuff about tampering. I mean, right, overall, there's a lot of bad things we could be hearing about that I think we aren't. 
Yeah, no, I think the things that I've heard about that I find worrisome are, you know, people being kicked out of the polls for wearing Black Lives Matter shirts as though that's somehow a form of electioneering, which it most clearly is not. Um, and again, we're seeing, you know, courts stepping in on that, but it's, you know, it's the immediate impact on people. And it's also the, the that sort of um, thread of racism that is going through so much of this, right? And who's impacted by this? And, um, and I think the same thing, I, I've seen some concerns about police presence at the polls and whether that's intimidating to voters and who it's intimidating to. Um, but overall, yes, it is a good thing that people are, are standing in line. And, um, and, you know, particularly because, again, I think one of the other barriers that happens on the day of is that election day is not a national holiday, right? It's hard for people to get off that day. It's hard to get off in the hours that uh, that's the polls may be open from your job to be able to go to do this. So it's- it well, is a, a friend I just met uh, told me that in Puerto Rico, it is a holiday. In Puerto Rico, the election day is a holiday. There's parades and caravans, car caravans. And so I, I think we need to adopt that rule. I agree with you. It is also a holiday for the National LGBT Bar Association. So <laughs> that is a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, and more law firms, more law firms are giving election day off at, or encouraging, uh, um, you know, their firms to get involved. And law students, if they have outstanding offers from firms, could call them and ask them what their policy is about that. That's great. Good action item. <laughs> um, so, you know, so, so once we've gotten there and people have voted, I think, again, you've touched a little bit on some of these challenges, the challenges to having your vote actually count after you after you've gotten there, you've gotten through the line, you've gotten it mailed in, whatever whatever means you got it in, um, there's some challenges to, to actually getting it counted. Um, and again, we've touched on that. Is there more you want to, either of you'd like to say about that? Well, I would just say, I mean, in addition to um, however you cast your ballot, making sure that it's counted, I think the other thing that we are expecting is that it's going to take a long time to count some of these ballots. So we are encouraging the public to just be patient. We want to make sure that whatever the election results that are published, that there at least is some legitimacy and some confidence that it was after as complete account as possible. So that's where we are. And that's where we also are trying to support some election administrators to recognize that it's a big job. I think there's some states where legally you cannot start counting the ballots until after the polls close. So, um, so I think that that is something that we're going to have to watch out for as well. Yeah, I agree. I think the mail, I mean, we've talked about this already, but the mail potential delays, um, uh, there are questions about different state laws and how soon after election day, if at all, <laughs> the, you know, it will count if you're if it's postmarked on election day but not received until later. So it's another really important reason to try to just get your ballot in the mail as soon as possible. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, this is all near and dear to me. I, I before I went to law school, I actually um, ran Alaska's absentee voting section for a number of years. And uh, so dealt with a lot of these issues myself on that side. And then, you know, the being working in Alaska and having it be the last state with the polls to close and the national news occasionally is waiting while you count those ballots. I can say, yes, it's, it's a lot of pressure on those poll workers who are sitting there trying to get those, get all those ballots counted. It's, it can be a lot. Um, particularly in a, in a year like this where we're focusing on not just a presidential race, but really closely watching the Senate and you know see where that's that's sitting in in flux as well. So um, I think the other big picture thing in the in terms of these challenges are um, you know the issues of really once people get to vote and they've been counted, you know, are are whose votes are equally weighted, right? Where where are places where um, and what are the reasons why sometimes people's votes are weighted more than others? Um, we have, you know, issues of gerrymandering. We have questions about the Electoral College to even just the Senate itself. Um, do you all want to talk a little bit about those? Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, it, we like to think that we live in a democracy. <laughs> and then, you know, at the end of the day, you some of these variations are, um, you know, are, are very hard to um, 
accept on a moral level, right? I mean, in, uh, I keep saying I live in California, but what, we have 40 million people here, and then you have, you know, some smaller states where, um, and we're not competitive on the national, you know, level in terms of which party is likely to win. So, you know, the, it's, it's dispiriting on the California side because it's hard to get as much interest in really important state and local issues because you don't have the um, uh, same degree of excitement about a presidential race as you would if you lived in Maine or, um, you know, Colorado or Montana or Wyoming or, you know, something where your, where your vote really, where you think your vote's actually going to um, matter in a numerical sense. And also, I mean, I guess maybe Wyoming's not close, but the other states are, you know, probably going to be competitive um, and, you know, and close. Um, and, and then, I mean, you, you touched on gerrymandering and um, I mean, there's two aspects. So there's gerrymandering could be in racial gerrymandering or also partisan gerrymandering. And, and the Supreme Court this year ruled that there isn't a claim. You can't bring a claim for partisan gerrymandering in, in federal court, although you still can, um, you know, in state court. And then racial gerrymandering can result in, I mean, there's, there should, there's a remedy for racial gerrymandering in section two, but it can take a long time to, you know, to resolve and, and it's hard to prove those, you know, claims. Um, what have I left out, Nancy, or <laughs> what else do you want to No, add? I think that's a good, I mean, I, I'll break it down in two ways as well. One, in terms of the, uh, the strength of your vote does often depend on the race at issue. So, you know, for SPLC, we decided to concentrate our work in Mississippi and Louisiana too, which nobody considers to be a battleground state, but there are places where we've seen more minority representation at the school board, city council, and county commission level, and where we're encouraging people to be actively involved. And then in those races, the extra benefit is that the voter gets to actually see and touch virtually now their elected officials whereas the congressional and even House, state and Senate, they're much further away, um, even though they're impacting people's daily lives. So we're trying to increase voter engagement, political participation, starting at the local level, because I think the results are easier to grasp. Um, so that's one thing. And then in terms of gerrymandering, I'm so glad that Laura started with a recitation of the Voting Rights Act, because I think that's where gerrymandering has really lived in terms of Section 5 being able to block a lot of plans that were racially gerrymandered or had a partisan a, a agenda using race as a proxy. And then we've also dealt with issues of prison gerrymandering. So we have an increased prison population that's being counted as uh, you know, people for purposes of redistricting. But when it comes time for them to vote, as I shared with you with respect to Florida, they're a ghost population. So there are a lot of um, techniques that could be used to dilute the strength of a person's vote, even when they go through all of the attempts you just discussed to cast it in the first place. Yeah. You know, and so one thing that doesn't, um, that we haven't touched on also is ranked choice voting. You know, we have this winner take all system for in most states, but Maine has passed ranked choice voting. I'm not sure if it's, it includes presidential elections, but it, it may. And this means, you know, if you, you vote for the first person um, who you want to win, but you also have a second, you know, you can also identify who your second choice would be. So that if, uh, you know, if your first person um, uh, couldn't make the cut, you know, a numerical cut, your vote might, would, would still count uh, when it came down to like, who were the final two top vote getters. Um, and I'll give California as another example, which is during the primary, we had an early voting period and many people voted uh, in, the, in the primaries, in the Democratic primary where there were still a lot of contenders at that point and they voted and during the early voting period, people were dropping out. 
So their votes literally, you know, they would have voted for somebody else if their candidate had, had um, if we had ranked choice voting, their vote would have counted in a much more powerful way. So that's another technique that is, I think, very popular in gaining, you know, gaining popularity both on the local level and, you know, maybe at, at the state level um, in the coming years. Thank you. Um, you know, another issue I see in this, in this big, big picture um, getting into gerrymandering and thinking about reapportionment and all that is census issues, right? What we've seen this year, so much, um, so it felt like so many efforts to squelch participation in census, particularly again in communities of color, which is going to lead to, you know, the reapportionment for the house, right? And, and that's, that's another problem that comes in here is, is in terms of thinking about how many people are really being represented by whose votes. Um, so I'd love to ask you both. I mean, we, I think we've talked a bit through this of the the theme of of you know people of color and particularly black people and often particularly black women being being heavily impacted by these challenges that we're talking about and and you know deliberately and systemically impacted. Um, how do you feel? I mean, do do you want to say more about that? And how do you feel LGBTQ people in particular are are potentially impacted by all these areas, whichever of you'd like to tackle it. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, I, I think we are at a wreck, you know, I think we have to decide what kind of a country we want to be. I mean, right. Do we want to be a country where we care about one another and everybody matters or not? And, you know, I think that's to a large extent what this election feels like it's about and um, you know, I think I keep coming, you know, I, I keep coming back to the fact that the polling that I'm seeing is showing a lot of enthusiasm all across the country about being counted and people wanting to be involved. And I think that speaks to people wanting to be in the majority of people wanting to be in a world where we care about one another and we live in a democracy and and we don't necessarily always agree at the end of the day but we want to have a platform for resolving our you know our differences and um i think most people are disgusted by the increase in racism or i don't know if it's an increase or, or a more obvious i guess there well i should take it back so there's always been racism but there's there's you know i think the incidence of racism and and probably nancy you have better statistics on hand from splc but i mean violent racist attacks are going up violent anti-semitic attacks are going up violent anti-muslim attacks and and it affects Affects voting, but I, you know, I think at the end of the day, we're we'll see what you know what what happens in this election. But it would be, um, you know, we can all hope that we will end up in a place where people will believe that equality matters and democracy matters and Black Lives Matter. Yeah, and I'll add attacks on LGBTQ people, particularly trans women of color, are up this year. Absolutely. I worked in Florida for a while when I was with the ACLU there and the the level of murders of black trans women that were not being reported, let alone investigated, is alarming and for sure something that there needs to be more light on that. And I raise that as an example to show that there are members of the LGBT community who find themselves at an intersection of race and class and gender identity and all of those things compounding themselves to make it more difficult for them as compared to others to access the ballot box. We know that's been the case when it came to photo ID, something as simple, some would say as a photo ID, didn't account for the fact that some people had um, changed their gender marker or hadn't legally changed their name, but everybody knows them as how they identify themselves, or poll workers or election officials who are not as sensitive to those issues and then don't know how to address those in public in a confidential, respectful way still. So those are some of the issues that we're finding. Um, 
I would say just like we need to be careful of not always tying the African American community to criminal justice issues because there's danger in that stereotype, but we still need to recognize for many in the LGBT community, they find themselves caught up in the criminal justice system and in some ways because of targeting, in some ways because of the employment limited opportunities that people have that make them more vulnerable to getting caught up in the criminal justice system. And then you couple that with a felon disenfranchisement law that makes it impossible for them to vote. So I think those are some of the issues that we're, we're looking at in terms of the LGBT community in particular, but we're also recognizing that there's strength and power and a loud voice in the LGBT community and a, and a hope that those voices become even louder and more visible to protect not only the interests of the communities, but the intersecting interests that are wrapped up within the community. So that's my hope and what we're working towards. Yeah, and because of, just on the specific theme of LGBTQ people, because, you know, in, um, it, ranked choice voting, I believe, could really help LGBTQ people because we're everywhere, right? We're not geogra in a particular geography, except, you know, maybe in particular neighborhoods in some cities, but we're everywhere. And so if you had ranked choice voting, you could have, let's just say on a county level, you could have an at-large election, but still allow people from across the county who have a common, um, you know, commonalities to group together to promote particular candidates. Um, and, uh, you know, so that would be a helpful, um, you know, a helpful change, I think, for people who, uh, you know, from our current, from our current system. And I just mentioned a couple of years ago, I was asked to if, if we could draw like an LGBTQ district. Um, because of the difficulties that members in the community have elevating to political office. So again, when you think about communities of interest, even in the redistricting context, there's a lot of opportunity for creativity there. So again, just encouraging people to think outside the box in terms of how best can you assure political representation for yourself. Thank you. And I, I think that, that sort of turns us to the theme of, of uh, you know, positivity and, and what we can be doing, right, in this, uh, for our last 10 minutes or so of our call. Um, one of the big themes you all talked about as we prepared for this call was the need for organizing, community organizing, and really understanding how to organize, and that that's a skill that, that people need to build. Um, can you both talk about that and talk about how each of your organizations tackles some of these problems that we're seeing? No, you, you, you're the one who really raised it. Yeah, we do a lot of we do a lot of organizing. So, and I'll say this for for since we have a law student organ, you know, uh, focus, which is at least when I was in law school, there was no focus on organizing, and I think that's a big mistake because where do laws come from? They come from people getting together and articulating their values and making laws that are uh, are helpful. So I would say to any law student, learn about organizing um, either in law school or on the side and and take it really seriously because at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's, it's, that's what makes politics work. So um, what we do is we, um, uh, we focus on high school students and uh, GSAs have been a, real model for us and kind of a, a guide to what democracy should look like in high schools. So in an ideal world, every high school would either have a future voters club or uh, a GSA or some other club in the high school that was responsible for making sure that every single person in that high school who is eligible to register to vote gets registered before they graduate. And that would be inexpensive and be great in terms of youth leadership development uh, because you would be giving students the opportunity to talk to one another, get volunteers, do publicity, find out what works, fix problems, um, and, and, and see their own political power increase. And we have seen youth voter registration drives work in 
a whole range of different high schools in terms of politics, in terms of ethnicity, because kids want to be involved. And, and one of the biggest things that young people care about is, you know, what each other are doing and, you know, what their friends are doing. And there's a lot of peer, um, you know, potential for peer influence in a really positive um, really positive way. So that's one of the big things we did. We created um, High School Voter Registration Week, which is the um, overlaps with National Voter Registration Day to give, um, because high schools need a little bit longer time and to give kind of an organizing framework. Um, and we created a program called Future Voters Action Week, where we teach young people over Zoom first how to um, articulate a public narrative in which they are able to connect the stories of their lives to public issues and deliver, you know, and say what that means to them with confidence to somebody else and to connect it to voting. And that's sort of part one of the program. And part two is the nuts and bolts of voter registration and how to organize a voter registration drive in your school. And we did it for the first time this year, it really came about because of the pandemic. And, but we were able to teach hundreds of kids, um, you know, how in, uh, lead them through this process and help them become, you know, leaders in their, um, in their schools. And, um, you know, so that's, and then in the long term, we're going to be advocating for um, more pre-registration laws. I mentioned this earlier that, that in, in 15 states and Washington, D.C., young people can pre-register to vote when they're 16. And it's not just blue states. It's also North Carolina, Florida, Maine, Colorado, Utah, Louisiana. Um, and so, um, so we want more states to adopt pre-registration at 16 laws because those laws create a framework in which these student groups can flourish and student groups can really make the most of those, you know, give themselves a two-year runway in order to get their peer group registered. And we want better implementation of the laws that do exist. And so, for example, most states that have pre-registration laws, there's no funding, no budget, no planning, no, and nothing that is um, equitable in terms of ensuring that it's done in all high schools throughout the state. Um, so those kinds of policy um, uh, initiatives and organizing around those are some of the things that we'll be doing after um, the election. That is all great and gives me hope. And I think is a perfect example of how if we're looking at voter suppression as a thing to be conquered, how we are dividing up the pie in terms of being able to tackle it based on our expertise and resources. So for SPLC, you know, we've adopted an integrated advocacy model, which includes litigation and advocacy, public education, along with the legislative piece. But I would say that, you know, even though they've all kind of been equal parts of the strategy, that I think we, we have to acknowledge that we're gonna have to elevate the organizing piece over the next 10 to 15 years. And that's just because for our issues, the courts are becoming a little bit more hostile and so although I don't believe in giving up on the courts, I do believe we have to keep these issues alive before judges, but that we have to build the, the community movement aspect of this so that we put the pressure points are coming from multiple sides because right now they're just hearing a bunch of lawyers arguing and for whatever reason, they're not really seeing the people we're representing. And as litigators, we have to do a better job at that. Um, so examples of trying to do that is, for example, we've got for SPLC a Vote Your Voice initiative where we've given grants directly to groups that have a proven track record of identifying, registering, and turning out voters, and then keeping them engaged in between the key election cycles so that it's not like, you know, a month before the election and everyone realizes our democracy is at stake. Or that, you know, you, you're, you see your politician knocking on your door two years later and you have no idea what this person has accomplished during their time in office. So those are the types of things that we're trying to address through voter engagement. And we're also trying to put more pressure on Congress to come up with some legislative solutions like 
reauthorizing Section 5 or the, the coverage formula of the Voting Rights Act so we don't have to sue on all of these issues and can nip some of these problems in the bud when they arise. So I'm excited about especially getting more young people involved in the process because literally that is the future and also trying to shift the paradigm in terms of how do we keep, again, voters engaged throughout the process and move away from this every two or four year interest in our electoral system? Beautiful. Yeah, and it's, it's so true. I, I love that you're identifying that, uh, Nancy, because, you know, what there's so much, um, you know, frenzy and spending all that's very transactional, right, in the last couple of months leading up to an election. It's like, okay, our numbers are numbers of voter registrations. And as opposed to building the community, you know, that you need to sustain it and creating a creating a community in which everybody votes, which I agree with you is a year round enterprise. So, you know, last thoughts here, I think are, you know, just what law students specifically can do. Um, and I, I, Kick that off by just inviting law students to go to our LGBT, lgbtbar.org uh, website. And if you look at the programs tab, there's a get out the vote page um, that has some, some resources can help you with figuring out, you know, uh, how do you vote yourself if you haven't already taken the steps to do that, um, how you might be able to help other people to vote as well and, and helping your colleagues at law school or people in the community um, in a number of different ways. So I encourage you to go, go look at that. And we've also been doing outreach efforts with our state and local LGBT bar affiliate uh, groups to help have them have the information to be empowered to encourage their communities to participate. Um, what, what are the recommendations that each of you would have for how, you know, what, how law students can help your organizations or just do other work themselves? I'll go. I, I, uh, so I'd say right now, between now and the election, I would say either sign up as a poll, if you're physically able to do this, sign up as a poll worker if your area still needs it or do election protection work, meaning be a poll monitor um, uh, or be on a hotline. And um, uh, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights that we work with very closely has a really great election protection, nonpartisan election protection program. Um, and so that's, I think, the number one. And encourage your law school to give you the day off or, um, you know, or just take it off um, that day to do, uh, you know, to do this work. Um, there's obviously phone banking and things like that to help people get out the vote, but I think lawyers should use their legal skills to help. In terms of in terms of um, the civic center, we uh, there is such an absence of legal research um, uh, on youth voting issues, and so we can use law student volunteers, um, especially after the election, to help us create. Um, state by state effective policies that um, high schools should adopt as best practices for doing voter registration in their school because there's a whole range of different uh, laws that affect it, curriculum, um, and law students can, we're gonna, that's one of the things we'll be doing after the election and we would love law student volunteers to help with that. Yeah, I would echo all of those uh, recommendations. And I really like the, the, the point about, you know, youth voting, because another rarely used constitutional provision is the 26th Amendment. And the claims that have been brought under the 26th Amendment related specifically to COVID have not gone so well. So yes, we know that senior citizens are more susceptible, but that doesn't mean that young people are immune. So there's been some equal protection claims related to age-based access to vote by mail. So I would say that that is an area that definitely could use some development in terms of creating you know, young people as a somewhat protected class of voters. I'd say the other thing is just to echo Laura's recommendation to go to the Lawyers Committee website, or you can call 866-OUR-VOTE. We are in desperate need of more volunteers on the legal side to help troubleshoot. And SPLC is partnering 
with that group as well. And then another issue for those of you on campuses who would like to increase your ease of voting is advocate for polling places on your campus. It's an issue that I worked on in South Florida, for example, we faced a lot of resistance, but it was the students and their voice and their influence and power, honestly, um, as some would say patrons of the university that got eventually some um you know that a compromise from elected some elected officials so that would be another thing in terms of just making it a little easier for your colleagues or classmates to vote as well yeah i i and can i just pick up one more thing on that point that you just made nancy which is Call it, there's a wonderful group called the All In Democracy Challenge and Students Learn Students Vote that helps uh, college students vote and they do a lot of work like what um, Nancy's describing. But my sense is that they are not very well connected with the law students and that there's a huge potential synergy if, uh, so maybe the law students can take the initiative and contact the college groups that are also working on the campus and, and you know, work in collaboration on some of those issues. I love that. And, and Nancy, I want to echo that um, suggestion about pulling place on campuses and I, I'll give another success story of advocacy where there, there was a polling place on the campus of the University of Georgia and um, the, the school announced that it was, was going to be closed and that students were going to have access to a shuttle bus in this time of COVID uh, on a shuttle bus to take them to a polling place that was in downtown Athens, Georgia. And you know the whole community re revolted against that and they reinstated it and not only reinstated but actually put it into the, the basketball stadium which is a better venue and much bigger and also more accessible to uh, to people in the community. So um, advocacy does work. It's a good thing to do. Um, and the, the only other thing I'll add to all of that is that law students, you know, I think, um, at least in my experience from as a as a former law student, is that I think students then who are, are parts of law schools as, as uh, aspects of main universities sometimes just are very disconnected from that main university. and and underestimate the degree of, of power that they can have in being advocates at the main campus and being leaders and helping out with the undergraduate GSAs that could be there. And, and to the extent that, um, that, that any law students are able to connect with those GSAs and help teach them about legal issues, you know, speak, speak with them and help get them organized, that can be a really powerful way to, to pay it forward. So um, any last words from either of you? Anything? wish we'd said? That's a great discussion. Thank you for organizing it. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I want to add one, one quote, which I have found helpful in thinking about organizing. And um, there's an organizer called Marshall Gans, and he teaches at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And he defines leadership as accepting responsibility for creating the conditions that enable others to achieve shared purpose in the face of uncertainty. And I, I share that quote wherever I go because I have found it like actually useful and actionable in my, in my life. And most definitions of leadership are not, they're very vague or they're just about writing a check or something like that. But this is a definition that people can come back and especially law students can think about, you know, what are your resources? You have a lot of resources. You're connected to all of these lawyers and other law students and, and professors. And if you are, you know, to a lot of people ask the question, oh, well, what can I do? And you know, instead of just asking that as a hypothetical, it's great to actually ask yourself, you know, like what can I do? And there's there's so much, and it's such an area in which, um, you know, when you look at when you look at what is behind these problems, often it's often it's either the law, the implementation of the law, or the lack of human interaction implementing the law. And law students are just so ideally suited to um, create communities that will um, you know, value democracy and bring it to life, so. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you, Laura. Well, thanks so much to both of you for speaking with me today. That'll, that'll wrap up our episode today. And uh, I'll just give a final reminder to anybody watching that if you'd like to continue to hear content like this, 
please be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You'll get notified when we release a new episode. And if you're watching this on the National LGBT Bars YouTube channel, please hit the subscribe button there. Hope everybody has a wonderful week. Please be sure to vote.